Okay, guys. So, first of all, who has questions about food? Probably all do, right? If you're here, everybody does. No? Okay. I know you do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We'll, we'll listen up. All right. So, my name is Casey Thaler. I write for um, Paleo Magazine, The Paleo Diet, which is the founder of the Paleo Diet, Dr. Warren Bourdain. Um, Paleo Hacks, um, other places that I'm probably forgetting, and uh, I'm working on my nutritional biochemistry PhD, so bear with me, it's a little bit sciencey, uh, but it, I'll explain everything, and I'll, anytime you want to ask questions, just let me know, and we'll explain it. Um, but As long as you speak slowly, I'll be, I'll be good. Oh yeah, tell me if I'm going too fast, okay. too, because I have a lot of information. So, so maybe we'll I, start with the paleo diet. Absolutely. Real okay, you want to start there? Well, okay. If that's what it's based on. Well, no, I thought he was going to start where he was going to start. I mean, I don't know what it's like. Sure. We'll get there. We'll get there. Um, okay, so the paleo diet, really quickly, would be um, no grains, no dairy, and no legumes, and no processed food. So you're basically eating healthy fats, vegetables, fruits, uh, organically sourced, ideally protein, um, that, that sort of thing. So, yeah, and there's some different variations, but that's the general overview of it. So, yeah. Hey, how are you guys? Very contrary to the standard the, American diet. Yeah, yeah or absolutely. The, the thought today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So not all of this will be like without the paleo diet. There's some yes. stuff in here that would apply. Yes. It's a paleolithic short form. Correct. Is yeah. There's no mesozoic diet yet that I'm aware of. How are you? Maybe I can point that one. Someone's supposed to pick Nancy, but I hope they actually get good. I need to go Yeah. So she's supposed to be here at seven. Okay. Um, all right, guys. So we'll just go through really quickly here. On the first slide, we see a lady. She's snorting some donuts, which obviously is supposed to be cocaine, but they replaced it with donuts to be sugar. Obviously, I'm sure all of you can somewhat relate to that. And then up here, we have a little uh, study from 2009 called The End of Overeating, and it's the food industry maximizes hedonic value of food. So do we all know what hedonic value of foods mean? Okay. Okay, so hedonism would be pleasure for the sake of pleasure, for you know, like no moral, ethical reason, that sort of thing. But uh, the food industry basically maximizes the reward from a food. So like if you eat like Reese's Pieces or a Snickers bar, right, you're going to get a lot of reward from that food. It's going to be pleasing, but you're not necessarily getting any nutrients out of it. So they literally, they have food chemists that their job is to maximize the reward of food. So. If you go to eat a candy bar, the, there is a food chemist literally that worked on it to make sure it had just the right amount of two of three things, salt, sugar, and fat, so you get the most reward in your brain from that food. So there's actually five factors that they identify that are involved in that. So high concentrations of potent ingredients, which amp up neurons, so that would be like salt, sugar, and fat. Uh, combining slash layering ingredients to achieve a bliss point, which I just touched on, uh, speedball analogy. So we'll go into that more in depth later, don't worry. Uh, and then variety, multi-sensory. You overcome sensory-specific satiety. So this means if you're eating like just butter, right, it's just fat, uh, you would eventually get sick of it. Your brain would say, hey, I've had enough. I don't want any more. But if you combine sugar and fat, like in a candy bar or something like that, you can eat it ostensibly forever and you'll never get sick of it. And it's literally designed that way. So it's very easy to become addicted to these foods and to be stuck on eating them and to feel like you crave them, and that, some of that is the sugar too, but that's what that means. And then novelty purple cow phenomenon would be uh, like Skittles, for example, right? Everybody sees Skittles and they're like, wow, that's really bright to my eye, that's interesting. Like, you look at broccoli, it's not all that visually appealing, right? It's one of the many reasons why it's somewhat not appealing. But you eat Skittles and you're like, wow, my brain's never seen this before, it's interesting, I'm gonna eat it. And that's part of why foods like that look like that, and they're specifically designed to look like that. So. That would be point number three on there. And then large portions, uh, portion distortion. I typically don't have to explain that one when I give this talk because if you go to a restaurant now, everybody will agree that the portions are just ridiculously out of control compared to what they used to be. And there's actual images and studies where they've looked at them and compared them and they're just, they're just amazing. Um, so that's another factor. And then aggressive and sophisticated marketing. Again, I usually don't have to explain that to people because it's so ubiquitous now. I mean, you drive a mile down the road and just count how many fast food ads you see. It's probably more than 10, and that's just driving. So um, TV, internet, all that sort of stuff has really amped up uh, their reach and what they used to do compared to now. Uh, and then you can see 
powerful and novel sensory experiences that maximize continued dopamine secretion. So you combine all of those techniques, right? And then you get, literally, food becomes addictive just based on those five factors. And even those five factors have sub-factors. So it's a very well thought out business model. And a lot of the executives at food companies used to be tobacco executives, which should really not be a shock to a lot of people. Um, but they operate under the same modus operandi. Like they say, this is what we're going to do. We need to get the most people buying our product continuously. We don't really care. Like health isn't a priority to them at all, your health especially. Um, so that's important information to know. And if anybody wants to look up anything during this uh, seminar, I'll be happy to send you the PowerPoint and everything's referenced. Like that's a study from 2009, so you can look it up yourself. Um, and then down here we just have an artist's rendition. Uh, what we think is going on in different parts of the brain, it's not really uh, accurate. It's just kind of a <laughs> nice little illustration. So we have ideality, initiation, cautiousness, sublimity. And you're going to get to why this is important in a second. We're mostly going to focus on the nucleus accumbens, which is the pleasure center of your brain, where you get reward from any exogenous source, so like a cigarette, alcohol, food, um, anything that you're not doing intrinsically. So like exercise gives you a nice stress relief, but it's inside your own body. You cause that you didn't have to ingest something to get it. So there's a big difference there, and there's an important uh, scientific difference. So. Lastly on here, we have the molecular structure of caffeine, which is 1,3,7-trimethylxanthine is its technical name. And you can see that the structure will be kind of important as we get into these things as to why things are addictive and why they're not addictive. So does anybody have any questions so far? Have I snowed anybody yet? I know I probably threw a ton of information at you. Okay, it's all right. We'll explain it. So, and again, if anybody has questions, feel free to ask. Um, is that a bad structure, that caffeine molecular structure? Uh, it is, but... It's not really inherently in that structure that it becomes problematic. Uh, to explain why that would be kind of bad, would you have to really get into like organic chemistry, biochemistry, and that's not usually the scope of this talk. But um, I'll show you a couple other ones, and you'll see why they can be important. Um, okay. So anybody that doesn't want to stay for the whole lecture, if they want to leave right after this slide, you can. Uh, yes, food is addictive for all the reasons I just described. Uh, and then we have a quote here from an actual study, and I'll just read this really quick. Uh, kind of get the gist of it. Junk food is food, food of little or no nutritional value that is high in fat, sugar, and calories. In addition, consumption of junk food has the ability to alter brain activity in a manner similar to illegal drugs like cocaine or heroin, and meaning it can be just as addictive. Junk food does not contain nutrients that are beneficial to the human body. In most cases, these foods are filled with harmful carbohydrates, fats, and cholesterol that do not provide any useful energy. As a result, somebody consuming junk food has reduced levels of essential nutrients, thereby causing weakness in the body. That is why the addictive nature of these foods is even more problematic. Junk foods have been identified as a major cause of heart disease, including myocardial infraction, cardiac arrest, and atherosclerosis. This is due to the fact that junk food contains excessive amounts of low-density lipoproteins and cholesterol that get deposited on the inner linings of blood vessels. Overall, junk food is very bad for your body and should not be eaten frequently. And you can see the reference down there as well. Uh, was anybody in there surprised by any of that information? Okay, everybody seems to be well aware of that. Uh, interestingly, the only people that seem to fight the hypothesis, well, to me it's a fact, but in the scientific community it's a hypothesis, that food is addictive is actually scientists because they want some causative exact mechanism, but it's not really ever going to be proven for a variety of reasons. So it's interesting because it seems like the world at large is at least somewhat aware of this information, but they in the scientific community want like exact proof and they, you know, some of that's politics, the food industry gets involved, but it's, it's good that you guys are aware of that. So over here we have a little guy, uh, it's an artist illustration of like a sick cell inside your body and kind of what results from eating a diet like this. So you see uh, spaghetti, which really has not a lot of nutrients, tomato sauce, which is basically pure sugar, and then chips, of course, is in his other hand. And he still looks like he's hungry, which I think is ironic. Uh, and then over here, on the right, we have a study from the Journal of Neuroscience in 2011, uh, Cheesecake Eating Rats and the Question of Food Addiction. So this is a neuroscience study where they actually looked at food addiction to see if it was addictive in the brain. So in the grant, this is in rats, and rats aren't identical to humans in a lot of ways, but they, it's the best they have to work on in some cases. So rats given extended access to high-fat, high-sugar food show behavioral and physiological changes that are similar to those caused by drugs of abuse. That's a pretty scary sentence right there. Um, but it goes on to state, 
Johnson and Kenny, who are the two researchers, uh, examined rats using behavioral models borrowed from drug addiction research, but instead of being given access to cocaine or heroin, the rats were given access to a cafeteria-style diet of energy-dense, high-fat and or high-carbohydrate food, including bacon, sausage, cheesecake, pound cake, frosting, and chocolate. The diet had two behavioral effects that were similar to those of exposure to addictive drugs. So anybody that ever questions this, they can just you can just send them that study that's literally a neuroscience study where they actually looked at this and they determined at least two effects right there off the top of the, uh, the top that it's no doubt addictive, no questions asked. Um, does anybody have any questions on this one so far? Everybody with me still? Okay, just want to make sure. Okay, so the longer version, uh, a little bit more detail here. And here's three more studies that you can you know, look up yourself or send to other people, uh, which many people do. Uh, so certain compounds in food are chemically rewarding, and that's the biochemical scientific basis for saying food is addictive. Uh, another neuroscience study from 2005, daily binging on sugar repeatedly releases dopamine in the accumbent shell. So the accumbent shell, we're gonna get into that, is the nucleus accumbens in your brain. It's quote unquote the pleasure center of your brain. So anything you do, that causes pleasure, that releases dopamine, is in your accumbent shell. It's a specific part of your brain, and we'll, we'll get there. Um, but again, that's just the abstract of a study that you could look up. Uh, drug addicts are addicted to drugs. Obese people are addicted to food. So in this study, uh, they looked at overlaps in the nosology of substance abuse and overeating, the translational implications of food addiction. Uh, it's pretty obvious in there, and I can read that too for you. The obesity epidemic has led to the postulation that highly palatable foods may be quote-unquote addictive for some individuals. This idea is supported by the fact that there are overlaps in brain circuitry that identify addictive behavior as well as overeating. In this paper, we discuss the utility of the concept, and then they go on to discuss it. Um, and then the third reference here is really interesting, which most people aren't aware of as even an idea, um, but the advent of agriculture, which caused the creation of our Neolithic foods, could possibly be explained due to the rewards found in these then novel food sources. So agriculture was invented about 10,000 years ago, I believe. I don't want to get that wrong. I think it's 10,000. Um, and there, these researchers are hypothesizing that the only reason it actually developed was because the foods were rewarding. And it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense when you look at it other ways, because agriculture involved more labor, less reward, more work, and there is no real reason why people that were hunter-gatherers or something like that would have adopted this unless there was a reason. So their hypothesis is that people found that these foods were at least somewhat mildly rewarding, and then they went on to develop agriculture and lived in that sort of culture. Um, and just to quote from that really quickly, these unsolved and until now unrelated problems may in fact solve each other. The answer we suggest is this. Cereals and dairy foods are not natural human foods, but rather are preferred because they contain exorphins. And we'll get into what exorphins are in a minute. Um, this chemical reward was the incentive for the adoption of cereal agriculture in the Neolithic. Regular self-administration of these substances facilitated the behavioral changes that led to the subsequent appearance of civilization. And that's from 1993, actually. So uh, this information has been out there in the scientific community for a pretty long time. There's a couple studies I'll reference in here that have been from like 1978. So this information, not well publicized, but as a scientific commodity, has been out there for a long time. Uh, and the human body has not changed at all in the last 100 years, but boy oh boy has our environment changed. Um, so again, it's not just in the foods you think. A lot of people come to me and they're like, oh, well, I know junk food's bad or fast food's pretty bad. I tend to avoid it for the most part. And they're usually surprised when you explain to them that there's stuff in dairy and grains that, while not as addictive or as pleasurable, can still lead to somewhat addictive uh, behaviors and reward in the brain. So this is from Brad Weeks, he's an MD, uh, and what he writes here really quickly, uh, wheat and dairy products contain opioid peptides influencing endorphin receptors in the brain. These peptides are physically addictive, causing dependence, asthma, obesity, apathy, ignorance, and numbness. The same goes for beta carbolines from prepared food. To be sharp and investigative, you ought to consume neither dairy nor wheat products. You don't need these quote unquote foods at all. And then he has a picture of Weetabix and milk over there, which is uh, to illustrate his point. So we get down here and we see the molecular structure of casein morphine, which is an opioid peptide found in dairy. And then we see the molecular structure of gliadorphin, which is the opioid peptide found in wheats. And again, we'll cite those papers later, but you can see that researchers have known about these things for upwards of 25 years, um, so, yes. Just talking a little bit too fast for me. Oh, sure, yeah. Sorry. no problem. Just a little bit. No problem. Okay, so um, what's interesting is that if you change 
one of these molecules, you can change the effect completely of a substance. So that's important to know. We're going to get to uh, dairy in the seventh position of the amino acid sequence, actually. So, okay. So here's where we get into the nucleus accumbens. So we have a pretty good illustration of the brain here, and you can see all the different regions. But what you really want to focus on here is the nucleus accumbens, which is this little red guy right here. And that's going to be basically the sensation of pleasure and reward is going to be. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Will you, do you by any chance have a handout of this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, sure. great. Because um, I, I, I probably want, you have so much information here, it's so great, you probably won't remember it all. Oh, that's okay. Yes, I get that all the time. Happy to provide it. Um, <laughs> So the only other thing on here that would be somewhat interesting to most people is the amygdala region, which is where you process basically like fear, emotions, that sort of thing. Guys with PTSD have a lot of problems in transmission across the amygdala areas of their brain, uh, and women too. I didn't want to be sexist there. Um, so <laughs> to quote from this study really quickly, the brain regions involved in sensation of pleasure and reward are among those most affected by drugs. So that's kind of a commonality that everyone understands, but seeing it spelled out in the literature is important because people take drugs to get pleasure and reward. They don't take drugs because they're like, hey, this sounds like a great idea and this is going to improve my life. They want the short-term reward. Uh, and when you get into the food and you eat foods that are rewarding, it kind of operates in the same way. Um, nobody eats broccoli because they think it's going to be a super fun time, but you <laughs> definitely eat like a candy bar or drink a soda because you're like, oh, this will be pleasurable, this will be nice. Um, I, you're a rarity, unfortunately, <laughs> these days. I do too, but there's not many of us left. <laughs> so the nucleus cummins, taken uh, together with the ventral tegmental area, constitutes the central link in the reward circuit. The nucleus accumbens is also one of the brain structures that is most closely involved in drug dependency. So I'm going to repeat that sentence because that's really important. Uh, the nucleus accumbens is also one of the brain structures that is most closely involved in drug dependency. So. Of all these regions here in all parts of your brain, that is the one that is most affected by being dependent on any sort of substance that's crossing the blood-brain barrier and causing some sort of chemical release. Uh, so the nucleus accumbens appears to be involved in controlling our motivations. So if you link these two sentences right here, what you can determine from the subtext is that it's involved in drug dependency and reward, if you go back to the first sentence. And it also controls our motivation. So we see this in all the time in people that are really addicted to something that's like an extremely addictive substance like cocaine or heroin. They literally won't start to care about anything but getting that drug or like an alcoholic, same, same sort of deal. And you can expand that to food. Obviously, you don't see that that much except in people that are extremely obese. I think there was a show on TLC where the guy ate like 30,000 calories a day or something. That would be an extreme example. Um, and I don't want to uh, say that food is that addictive to so like cocaine or heroin or something like that, but it operates through the same pathways, and that's what's important to note that I don't think a lot of people are aware of. Um, Excuse me, sorry. Sure. I just want to, um, you said about the motivation. That's coming from that, where's the motivation part coming from? In the, in sure, the, the nucleus, the cummins right here. Yeah, so, that's, that's okay. where it is, okay. Uh, example, like if somebody's never had alcohol before, like they're naive, right? And then they drink it and they get a reward in the nucleus of Cummins, they're going to be more motivated to drink alcohol in the future. It's the, yeah, it's a pretty simple mechanism. Um, it's kind of interesting to me how many things are just affected by that, though. Like people are extremely motivated by seemingly innocuous things. Um, so the nucleus of Cummins appears to be involved in controlling our motivations and also the frequent consumption of a drug is known to tremendously increase the amount of the main neurotransmitter in this part of the brain, dopamine. So that's an important sentence too. Uh, frequent consumption of, we'll just say anything, I use drug, but you could say anything, <coughs> is known to tremendously increase the amounts of the main neurotransmitter in this part of the brain, dopamine. So if you constantly smoke cigarettes, you're gonna get more uh, dopamine, at least at first, in the brain. So you're going to be motivated to keep smoking, even though you know it's bad for you. You probably are aware that it's not the best thing for your health. But it's something bigger than that going on in your brain, and that's what most people aren't aware of. They just know, like, hey, I want another cigarette. Uh, so that's one example. Uh, but then they say in the last sentence, we can therefore better understand the drug addict's obsessive drive to keep seeking more of the drug. So it's easy to extrapolate this out to food, where you see people that literally just keep eating the same foods that they know are making them unhealthy, but they can't stop. And this is literally the scientific basis for it. Um, and then this is another study from the journal Neuroimaging. Nucleus accumbens response to food cues predicts subsequent snack consumption in women and increased body mass index in those with reduced self-control. 
So it's kind of circular there because the more you're eating these foods, especially in some people, uh, the less self-control you're gonna have. So it is like a circular logic there. Um, but you can literally, they studied it, it, how sensitive you are in your nucleus accumbens to these kinds of things predicts how much you're gonna eat of it and how fat you're gonna get basically, which is BMI, body mass index. Um, so any questions so far? I know I've thrown a ton of information at you now. Um, I have sure. a question. So if you're predisposed to have reduced self-control to begin with, does that mean you're more susceptible to food addiction? Absolutely, and there's a slide, in a, I think one or two slides, where we literally look at different parts of the brain and people that are addicted to different things and how your dopamine gets downregulated. And there's people are made of different genetic material, so if you're uh, more susceptible to these things, I would stay away from anything that can be construed as addictive. Um, and you'll see that all the time. I had numerous clients that were either alcoholics or some kind of substance dependency and then they became extremely addicted to caffeine or exercise or it's a cross sensitization sort of thing. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Um, all right, so here it is right here. Um, this is a, kind of, to me it's terrifying. Uh, these are MRIs, so functional MRIs of brain images. Uh, so you see the red is the dopamine that's left in the brain, right? So like we saw on the last slide, the more you consume something, the more dopamine you excrete, at least initially. But the brain and the body are really smart, and they like to stay in this thing called homeostasis, which means everything the same. So like, um, if you start exercising, right, it's really hard at first because you haven't exercised. And then like three months later, you're like, oh, this is really easy. That's the, what's happening, the similar mechanism with uh, eating, smoking, cocaine, that sort of thing. So we see it get down regulated because these are what the levels should be on the bottom here. The red is the dopamine. You want a lot of that. That's nice, that's good. Your brain's processing things. You're not addicted to anything probably. You're healthy for the most part, at least in your brain. But then you see people that are addicted to cocaine, they have no dopamine left. They've used it so much that they need more and more just to get the quote unquote same reward, but eventually that becomes nil. Uh, and then you'll hear that all the time. People that are like heroin addicts are like, I don't even enjoy it. I just do it so I don't get sick to avoid the withdrawal. Uh, that's what's happening, why they don't enjoy it anymore. And then alcoholics, you see the same thing. And what's surprising to most people, and I have the little red arrow there, is obese people demonstrate the exact same downregulation. It falls somewhere between alcoholic and someone that's completely <laughs> dependent on cocaine, which in itself is pretty scary. Um, so does anybody have questions on that? Yes, absolutely. Um, for somebody that has a severe caffeine addiction, sure. where, where would their brain, what would their brain look like? There is a whole slide on caffeine, but probably um, it's not as bad as an alcoholic. Caffeine, for the most part, is probably the safest addiction um, out of everything you could consume. There are some issues there about aging, and that it literally alters the ends of your DNA. But um, as far as these things go, these are pretty much acutely toxic, whereas caffeine it may be chronically toxic, which means over time it could be bad, but it's not like something that would kill you immediately. It's not something that would be really bad uh, as far as like cocaine, alcohol. Even food, I would say, is a worse addiction than caffeine, so, yeah. Is it connected to the dopamine? Oh, depletion? absolutely, absolutely. There's a whole uh, cascade of downstream signaling that happens when you drink caffeine. Um, people drink it usually because they're tired, right? So. Mm -hmm. The way caffeine works is it binds to your adenosine receptors. Adenosine is literally what makes you feel kind of even and sleepy. So like at night, your adenosine is kind of helping you go to sleep. So it binds to those receptors. So those receptors that would normally be making you feel tired because you didn't get a good night's sleep, all of a sudden blocked. So your body's like, okay, I'm ready to go. Like after you had a cup of coffee. So what happens, uh, your body is really smart, right? And it tries to keep things in homeostasis, like I said. So over time, you start having more and more of those receptors. So you need like four or five cups of coffee just to fill the receptors that are now there. And if you don't get it, you feel really tired because you have a hundred dope, you have a hundred adenosine receptors and they're not getting filled. So does that answer your question? I hope that it does. There's a whole slide on caffeine too. Oh, okay, so, good. Yeah, I actually love caffeine. I have a whole <laughs> article on it. And yeah, it's an interesting thing. Um, so this is a study from a neuroscience journal. It actually was on a pen, which is rare because they don't have a lot of nutrition. and that sort of studies, but um, so uh, I'll just read it and then I'll explain what this means in layman's terms. Uh, amelioration of binge eating by nucleus accumbens shell deep brain stimulation in mice involves D2 receptor modulation. So D2 receptors are your dopamine receptors, specifically in the nucleus accumbens. So they went in, and again, this was in mice, so it's not exactly translational, but it's pretty good. And they modulated with a surgical procedure the dopamine receptors that we're seeing here. 
and they actually got rid of binge eating, which is pretty amazing. Uh, this was only April of last year, so it's pretty new information. But they were able to get rid of it completely. Uh, so the, the hope and the funding for this, the reason they do studies like this, is that they could cure it in humans eventually. Now, it might not be exactly the same mechanism, but studies like this get funding and they get public publicity because it's important because the obesity epidemic is really becoming a problem. It's not even an epidemic. Technically, it's a pandemic, which means it's across the world, not just the US. Um, but there, it's interesting because they can just change those receptors and get rid of it completely, which further hypothesizes that, you know, or further proves the hypothesis that these things are extremely addictive, but foods cause the same downregulation, and by fixing the biochemistry in the brain, you can actually fix the behavior, which is pretty interesting uh, from a scientific perspective. And then another, uh, actually from the same study, sorry, hedonic overconsumption contributing to obesity involves altered activation within the mesolimbic dopamine system. Dysregulation of dopamine signaling in the nucleus accumbens shell has been implicated in reward-seeking behaviors such as binge eating. So again, you get a dysregulation of dopamine signaling in your brain. So somebody that's a kid, they've never had sugar, they've never had caffeine, let's assume they're not genetically predisposed to any sort of addiction, they're not going to react the same way in their brain to the way somebody that was an obese person or a food addiction person would react. And that's literally spelled out right there. So does anybody have questions on that stuff so far? We're good? Okay. So this is a pretty simplistic model, but I put it in here for a reason because it's easy to understand and as you can see the circular logic. So sugar is by far the biggest thing that people are addicted to. No doubt, no questions asked. Um, I would say everyone pretty much knows that without having me tell them that. Uh, but the model is interesting because it's actually working in a way that people don't realize. So you eat sugar, you like it, you crave it, it has addictive properties. Everybody's somewhat aware of that. Now, as far as what's happening in your body, your blood sugar levels spike, dopamine is released in the brain, that equals addiction like we just talked about, and then your mass insulin is created to drop blood sugar levels, and that's really where the problems start to arise as far as obesity goes. Um, and then blood sugar levels fall rapidly, high insulin levels cause immediate fat storage, so what happens is your body actually shoves the excess glucose into fat cells, your adipocytes, and that causes you to store fat. And then the real problem here is so you're storing fat almost immediately and then your body's craving more sugar because your insulin is dropping so rapidly that you want more sugar to feel better uh, and then that leads to hunger and cravings, low blood sugar levels, increased appetite and thus the cycle is repeated you go back to step one. So it's probably the most simplistic thing I have in here but I think it's really important for people to understand and it really is a simple model. I mean it's just like anything else but uh, Sugar is just surreptitiously added to everything these days that it's really hard to avoid it unless you're cooking all your food or you're actually choosing foods that don't have sugar on purpose. And it's harder to do that than it used to be. It's a lot harder. Yeah. And the environment has changed completely with even in the last 10 to 20 years, I mean, let alone like 60 or 70 years. And, uh, you know, the, but the body hasn't changed at all. Um, so it's really important to know. Does anybody have questions on this one? No, number two. Sure. Circle number two. Absolutely. I, I can't see dopamine is released in the brain. Dash. Mm -hmm. Equals, addiction. Equals addiction. Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah, it's, I can barely okay. see it from up here. Okay. Equals addiction. Yeah. Okay. And then period. Mm -hmm. Mass insulin secreted. That's mm -hmm. another sentence. Uh, it's actually mass insulin secreted to drop blood sugar levels. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Sorry. It's a no, little bit hard to read. Okay, so types of sugar. This is definitely stuff that most people are not aware of, uh, but probably you probably know the names, high fructose corn syrup, maybe you know fructose, and maybe glucose, but the structures and why, uh, how they operate in the body are what's really important. So glucose is found in plants, uh, also known as dextrose. Every cell in the body can use it. So if you eat like vegetables, if you eat some rice, if you eat uh, like fruit is half glucose, you're getting glucose, but every cell in your body can use it for energy, so you don't store it, you don't actually get fat from it, you usually just burn it off, assuming you're not insulin dependent or insulin resistant or leptin resistant, um, and that's the structure here. So you can see fructose uh, isn't all that structurally different, but it is biochemically completely different, and that's what's important. Um, so all forms, including fruits and juices, are commonly added to foods and drinks for palatability, and taste enhancement and for browning of some foods such as baked goods. So uh, what most people aren't aware of, if you eat like a chocolate chip cookie, right, you know how it browns and we're just inherently attracted to that, that's actually part of why we eat foods that are 
cooked like that, and fructose usually is added to them to help the browning. It's called the Maillard reaction in your body. But when you eat fructose, especially in excess, you're actually browning your liver the exact same way. <laughs> the same reaction, it's not enzymatic glycation, is going on inside your body as it is when you cook food in the oven that's browning or you're grilling something. Uh, and you can look at it. I mean, you can see the studies where they have like new liver tissue from a newborn and then like 80 year old uh, liver and it's brown. And it's supposed to be brown and it's a normal part of aging, but the rate at which you brown is totally in like you're in control of it. <laughs> so it's lifestyle related. Um, so then we go down to sucrose, which is commonly known as table sugar. But what's interesting is you'll see the food industry listed as cane sugar, beet sugar, any other, there's like 80 different names that they all use, like Florida crystals, what does everybody think that is? It's just sugar. Florida, Florida crystals. <laughs> yeah. Evaporated cane juice, it's just sugar. You evaporate cane juice, what do you get? You get sugar. So they have like 80 words. I definitely recommend Googling it because it's like on every package ever. Mm -hmm. People won't realize it unless they read the actual label. Um, but How it's about important. Agave? There's a whole thing on agave, but it's mostly fructose. So it's not one of the ones I would uh, recommend. But there are alternatives to that. So. Um, but you can see the structure isn't all that different. And then high fructose corn syrup, I know they drew them differently here, but if you understand organic chemistry and that sort of thing, they're actually exactly the same structurally. Uh, the only reason high fructose corn syrup is bad is because it's cheap. And that's where economics come into this and politics. Uh, Richard Nixon's actually food, I think it was his food agriculture advisor, I'm sorry, looked for a way to keep food cheap because it was going up and down the price of food and that was Nixon and his paranoia was like, oh, well, I have to keep food evenly priced. That's one thing that could cost me the election. So he figured out a way, he got this from the Japanese actually, they invented it. Uh, high fructose corn syrup was really cheap and they could add it to everything instead of regular sugar and people seemed to like it. Food stabilized the price and everything went according to plan. Uh, but it's 55% fructose and 42% glucose, which is important as we'll uh, venture on. But everybody thinks high fructose corn syrup is bad because it's you know somehow different than fructose or sugar. It's not. It's just cheap, and they add it to everything, and that's part of the problem. Um, so this explains that more in depth. Uh, and this is interestingly, the Corn Refiners Association, which normally does horrible things, uh, actually really put out some interesting, correct information when they were trying to combat all the uh, bad publicity the high fructose corn syrup was getting a couple of years ago. So this is from their own presentation, but it's actually scientifically correct. So once absorbed into the bloodstream, sugar and high fructose corn syrup deliver the same sugars at the same ratios to the same tissues within the same time frame to the same metabolic pathways. So that's 100% correct. Anybody telling you that you know, white table sugar is somehow different or worse than high fructose corn syrup from a biochemical perspective is completely wrong. Uh, it's worse because it's cheap and they add it to things. So, like I said here, uh, high fructose corn syrup and sucrose are processed identically by the body. It's not worse than table sugar biochemically. And high fructose corn syrup and table sugar are both equally bad. So if you had 40 grams of table sugar and you had 40 grams of high fructose corn syrup, they're both equally bad. Um, but one's a lot cheaper than the other and that's where it becomes a problem. So sugar is sugar is sugar is the title of that slide. Okay, does anybody have questions before we get into this a little bit more in depth? Yes, Was absolutely. the first one glucose, is that as bad? No, glucose is by far the best thing oh. you should be yeah, okay. eating or using. And you can actually get dextrose, which is another name for glucose, just as like a, a way to like make baked goods and that sort of stuff. And that's what I definitely recommend everybody do. That's what I do. It's a little bit harder to find, but you can definitely get it. Uh, Amazon or Wegmans probably has it, Whole Foods. Yeah, and you'll see why in a second. Okay. Um, so fructose equals problematic. So I won't kill you all with the entire biochemistry of fructose, but if you want to look it up, it does exist. And that's the entire pathway from fructose going into your liver, the whole process, every biochemical reaction, and then how it leads to increased uh, insulin, increased triglycerides, obesity, muscle insulin resistance, the whole thing. Actually, brain insulin resistance too, which is really interesting. But it is mostly processed by the GLUT5 receptor in the liver, which is actually in here if you look at it. And uh, that is an important thing to know right off the bat. It's mostly processed, I'd say about 80%, by the GLUT5 receptor in your liver. So if you eat, like, let's just say vegetables, right? Uh, you know, even like a sweet potato or something like that. It's mostly glucose. Every cell in your body can use it. It doesn't really spike your insulin all that high if it's low in sugar. And you can burn off the energy. But if you drink like a soda, which is mostly high fructose corn syrup, and it's mostly fructose, you don't get the same effect. Uh, it all basically goes to your liver. 
your liver burns it and then you can't really use it for energy. And that's the important difference. Um, so we'll explain that a little bit more. It's the Journal of uh, Clinical Endocrinology study from 2004. Dietary fructose reduces circulating insulin and leptin, attenuates postprandial suppression of ghrelin, and increases triglycerides in women. So uh, does everybody know what insulin is? Okay, it seems like yes. How about leptin? No. Okay. So leptin is your satiety hormone. So if you eat like a steak, it has a lot of protein. Protein's the most satiating of any macronutrient. So you're gonna feel full because leptin, which is a hormone, gets signaled to your hypothalamus in your brain and says, hey, I had enough food, I'm good, I don't want to eat anymore. So fructose actually reduces that. So you actually feel less full. And there's actually a specific study where they gave kids like a soda before they went into McDonald's. And they were thinking, oh, well, if we give them a soda, they're taking on calories, they're going to eat less when they go into McDonald's. They actually end up eating more than the control group, which should not get a soda, because it actually decreases the feeling of satiety and fullness. So it's really interesting when you look at foods that are mostly fructose or eating a lot of fructose, because you actually will overconsume as a result of that. And it's a simple choice, but I mean, it's really important to understand why that's a problem. And then ghrelin, which is the next thing in there, and then postprandial just means after a meal, it's the scientific terminology. Um, so it suppresses ghrelin, which is your hunger hormone, which you would think would be good, but it actually is not uh, in this scenario. And then it increases triglycerides. Everybody knows that triglycerides are bad. Um, when you go to get your cholesterol checked, uh, that's one of the things that they will look at. Um, so it does not raise insulin levels, reduces leptin, and increases triglycerides. And this is all different than glucose. Glucose has none of these detrimental effects whatsoever. So anybody eating an apple or like a sweet potato, it's totally different types of sugar, which is really interesting. Um, and most people would never differentiate that. Uh, okay, so next uh, we have a journal study from the American Diet Association, and Robert Lustig actually is a great uh, pediatric endocrinologist at UC Berkeley, and he does this whole presentation on fructose that I recommend anybody watch. It has like five million views on YouTube. It's like the only, uh, <laughs> only sugar video that ever got any mainstream publicity or anything like that. And he's a, he's a genius guy. He worked at a PhD in biochemistry that they worked out this entire process, actually. Um, but the study is called Fructose Metabolic Hedonic and Societal Parallels with Ethanol. So ethanol, of course, being alcohol. So he's looking at how your body processes it basically the same way, metabolically. Hedonic, meaning people drink like soda, which has a lot of fructose, for just the reward. It has no value to your body. And then societal parallels with ethanol in that people consume it like ad nauseum, sort of like alcohol, like beer, vodka, that sort of thing. Uh, and that's the great study. I definitely recommend anybody uh, that's interested in this, definitely look that, um, look that one up. Um, so your body has no use for it. You, you consume it and you just can't use it. It's just extra calories, but it's almost not even just extra calories. It's like detrimental calories because you'll eat more as a result and other things will go wrong. Um, so again, a third study here. Uh, fructose effects in brain may contribute to overeating, and they're being generous here. That was 2013, January. They've determined that it definitely contributes to overeating since then, but you have to be extra cautious in the scientific community. You have to use the word may until something is proven beyond anybody's shadow of a doubt. Um, so it leads to overeating due to lack of satiety signal to the hypothalamus, which is in your brain. So does anybody have questions on this? I know it's kind of complicated. Everybody's good. Okay. So. Inevitably, people just ask me, well, what foods should I avoid? What has fructose in them? Because they don't necessarily care about all the details, but they want to know what they should eat, what they shouldn't eat. And specifically to feed your kids, too, I'd say is really important because when they're developing is the best time to feed them a healthy diet because the developing brain needs a lot of nutrients and you want to avoid any kind of dependence that you might later on develop in life. So, number one, not a shocker, <laughs> carbonated beverage cola with higher caffeine, pop soda, soft drink. And then it'll tell you the milligrams of fructose. And 29,000 is a lot of milligrams, especially for something that only typically has 140 to 160 calories. So the reason that you'll see number two is the same thing, but without caffeine, is because caffeine is actually bitter, and you have to add more sugar to cover up the taste of caffeine. So this is one thing that until you really research the food industry, you will probably never know. Uh, the reason they have caffeine in the drinks is to make them more addictive. So that's one of the reasons. Um, but they actually have to add more sugar just to cover up the taste because it's bitter. It's a methyl xanthine, and they're traditionally bitter. Um, so that's why that's in there. It's an important distinction to make. And then three, again, uh, carbonated beverage, lemon lime soda. They're talking about Sprite without naming it. Um, actually, that wouldn't be Sprite because it has caffeine. But um, 
Four is a shocker to most people. Applesauce, canned, unsweetened applesauce with added ascorbic acid, ascorbic acid, vitamin C. But you can see it's not very different <laughs> in the amount of fructose. So people feed kids applesauce all the time. They get the unsweetened version thinking it's going to be good, but it's basically like giving them a soda as far as the fructose goes, which is really unbelievable to most people. So where does sure. the sugar come from? So apples just are 23. Added? Uh, in that case, it's just probably the apples. It, apples have 23 grams of sugar and most of it's fructose, so it's not one of the best foods to eat, which is surprising to most people. It's actually the lowest on a nutrient density chart, too. It has the least nutrients of any fruit. Yeah. So it's not just because it's fruit that it's would be sucrose. You, you have to know the fruits that are fructose. Mm -hmm. Correct. And the, there's a whole chart in here that has just the fruits, too, and they're like literally ranked. So like we'll get to that, but it's a surprising list for most people, absolutely. Um, and again, there's other factors, like it's easy to give somebody applesauce instead of giving them something else that you have to prep, and that's, you know, that's a factor as well. Um, but then you see applesauce can unsweetened without the vitamin C, so again, we have the same thing where you're adding in like a synthetic vitamin, and it's actually making it more bitter, so they add more sugar to cover up the taste of it. Um, and then honey is always a shocker, because I get a lot of people that are very into healthy uh, ways of life, and they're always surprised that honey has only 300. <laughs> Uh, 3,000 less milligrams of uh, fructose than a soda does, so it's basically pure fructose. There are some minerals in honey, there's some beneficial stuff, but it's not really one of the best things to be sweetening things with at all. Uh, and then pears, another really high fructose uh, fruit. Agave, which is number eight, which is, again, shocking to most people, but it's mostly fructose. So if you're going to sweeten uh, stuff, I would say dextrose is the best way to go. You can use stevia, which is a non-caloric sweetener, but stevia does have issues, which we'll get into. And the bottom line is that none of these sweeteners are going to be perfect. You're going to have to pick your battles. You know, if the worst thing you're eating is a little bit of honey from time to time, you're doing okay. Uh, you, people tend to get kind of absolutism with this and extreme with this, but you just generally want to think of what's on the worst list and try to avoid it and go for stuff on the better end most of the time. You know, none of this stuff is acutely toxic. It's not going to kill you, like if you have a little bit of it. Um, so then we see Sprite specifically listed, I'm not sure why, at number nine, and then juice. Apple and grape blend with added vitamin C. Apples raw without skin. So the applesauce actually has more because they're covering up the vitamin C. Um, but it is still number 11 as far as the high fructose foods. And it's important to note that 12 and 1 are only separated by about 4,000 milligrams. So it's not a huge difference. And then a different kind of uh, agave as well. And then, unsurprisingly, you get the juices. So the juices are really high because they take out um, all the fiber, and they take out anything else in there that wouldn't be sugar, basically. So juices are one of the worst things to give kids, especially. Uh, you definitely want to give them whole fruit if you're going to give them fruit, and we'll get into the list of the best fruits to give them. Um, so we just see four juices right there, apple, grape juice. And then salad dressing, fat-free salad dressing. This is surprising to most people, is number 17. And again, we're only 6,000 milligrams away from the number one thing, which was a soda. So mm -hmm. if you're going to get salad dressing, Italian dressing, fat-free is not the best. Yeah. So on the salad dressing ingredients, will it say fructose? No, it'll say sugar. It'll say some version of sugar. Say so sugar. yeah. So I would just, as a general rule, if you really want to work on things, I would say anything that has added sugar, just don't even buy it at all, whatsoever, <coughs> uh, as best you can. Um, and then when you do have something like that, don't feel guilty about it. Just move on because people get weird neuroses about that too. Um, so um, pomegranate juice bottled, again, pomegranate juice is something people drink all the time. They think it's super healthy, really not. Um, grapes, red or green, uh, which again, are really high in fructose. There's a researcher that just calls grapes like little bags of fructose because they're literally, there's not much else in them. There's a little bit of vitamin C, but it's not really enough to counteract the sugar. Um, and then pears, and then dates in the paleo world, people well, all the time make recipes with dates thinking they're really good and it blows my mind. <laughs> like, I don't understand it. The dates and the honey, and people love it because they think it's quote unquote natural. And there's a couple things in there, but it's really not much better. And then if you eat the, wrap, the apple with the skin, it's slightly lower on the scale because you're getting the skin. And then more uh, juice and then watermelon, which isn't really surprising. People generally know that watermelon's not that healthy of a choice as far as fruit goes. That's why they kind of crave it. And then all this is available nutrition data dot self dot com is that specific uh, thing, but you can look it up under any database of nutrition information. It's a little bit harder to find because the USDA is not necessarily going <laughs> to advertise this sort of stuff, but it's definitely out there and it's easy to access if you're looking for it. Um, so the fruit one is what everybody's interested in for the most part. So 
These are the better choices on the left. You can see they have very little as far as grams of fructose. So even like, let's just look at a pineapple, which is really sweet. I mean, I think of a pineapple, I think of it's pretty sweet fruit. It has four grams. Compared to figs, dried figs, 23 grams of fructose. And this is the same serving size for the same calories. So there's a really big difference in this stuff. Um, so any of these on the left, and this is what by far most people are interested in, are ones I would recommend if you're going to eat fruit on a regular basis, stick to these for the most part. Uh, and the best ones are going to be the dark berries. So blackberries, raspberries, cranberries, uh, cherries even, strawberries. Those all have tons of antioxidants in them. So you can take a little bit of the hit with the fructose because there's so many other beneficial compounds in there like polyphenols and that sort of thing. Um, the only reason I have blueberries on the right here highlighted because it's so beneficial that it's worth taking a little bit of fructose hit for the most part. I wouldn't overdose on blueberries, but um, they're one you can definitely get away with because if it's so beneficial, it's probably the best fruit that there is. It does have a little bit of fructose in there though. Blueberries? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have it in my shake every morning. I definitely recommend to anybody if they're looking to do a fruit, like that's the best one to go with. And any of the darker berries, like I said. And again, it doesn't mean like eat like eight handfuls of them, but it means if you're gonna incorporate fruit in your diet, that would be the best choice to make. And then the surprising stuff that has a lot of fructose, uh, bananas, doesn't have a ton of vitamins and nutrients. Uh, potassium, you can get way more from coconut water, which is interesting. Uh, apples, which we already covered. Watermelon, pear, raisins, grapes, mango, apricots. The dried stuff is always going to be worse because they remove uh, anything that isn't sugar, basically. <laughs> um, and then boysenberries, peaches, people are surprised, but it's oranges. so. And again, these aren't terrible choices. If the worst thing in your diet is an orange, you're not doing that bad. So it's not like an absolute decision, but it's important information that I think a lot of people don't uh, know about. So does anybody have questions on this stuff? Sure. Uh, the clementine, is that not a citrus like the orange and the tangerine? Where is clementine on here? There it is. It's pretty good. It's not huge as far as antioxidants go. So it's it's, not, it's kind of like a benign thing. You can eat it if you like them, but it definitely shouldn't be the majority of your calories. So yeah, but it's lower in fructose, so it's not a bad choice at all. Um, okay. So this is artificial sweet. Well, we're not quite the artificial sweeteners. This is regular sweeteners. So their scale here, first of all, is wrong, which uh, it just starts to show you the bias that the food industry has towards these things. So their rating of 100 is their standard measure. They've given that to fructose, which is mostly, it's still mostly fructose. So it's really interesting that the glucose isn't their baseline measurement. That's not 100, it's 70 to 80. So that alone is kind of interesting. But this is a relative sweetness scale. So um, lactose, which is milk sugar, is not very sweet at all. Nobody drinks milk thinking I'm getting a ton of you know, sugar and not really drinking it for that. Maltose, same deal, 30 to 50. Galactose is also found in milk, uh, 35. Then it jumps up, you can see glucose, 70 to 80. High fructose corn syrup is almost twice as sweet, um, so that's important to note. And fructose on its own is also twice as sweet, and then sucrose falls somewhere in the middle at 100. Um, so pure fructose, such as the kind found in fruit, is 40% sweeter than table sugar, which is already 50% fructose, so that's important to note. And then high fructose <coughs> corn syrup is 20 to 60% sweeter than table sugar, which is again, already 50% fructose. So, um, and then lastly, glucose, which is found in plants and partially in some fruits, is not the baseline measurement used. It is actually 20 to 30% less sweet than the baseline measurement sucrose. So does anybody have questions on that? Okay. So this is where it gets kind of crazy, uh, because artificial sweeteners are so prevalent in our society now, they just add them to everything. Even if you don't realize they're in there, they usually are. So this scale, which also makes almost no sense, They've made sucrose now one, okay, that's fine. Um, so these things are literally 300 to 600 times sweeter than uh, table sugar. So this is why the artificial sweetener is part of why they're not really great. Uh, most people aren't aware of this either. So sucralose, which they've now decided is like kind of the industry standard because everybody freaks out about aspartame, is 600 times sweeter than sugar. So even if you're not getting the calories, it's a non-caloric sweetener, you're still telling your brain, hey, I'm eating something that's 600 times sweeter than sugar. Your brain knows that and it gets a lot of uh, enjoyment from that. It's not a complete uh, dopamine pathway, which we'll get to in a minute, but that's why it's uh, important to differentiate. Then they sulfamine, they don't add that to that many things, but still in some things, 200 times sweeter. Aspartame, of course, is the big one. 180 times sweeter than sugar. 
Cyclomate, which you can't even get in the U.S. anymore, uh, it was actually the best one as far as sweetness goes, but it has other problems, 30 times sweeter than sugar. And then saccharin, which I don't believe they use all that much anymore, but was big, I think, in the 70s and 80s, uh, 300 times sweeter than table sugar. So this is one reason why the artificial sweeteners are not so great. Um, there's other reasons, which we'll get to. But um, artificial sweeteners are worse than table sugar, which again, remember, is still have fructose in regards to how hyperpalatable they are. So palatability would be how much you enjoy the food. Hyperpalatability would be any processed food whatsoever. And again, it's manufactured that way on purpose. They paid for somebody to do it molecule by molecule to make sure that's what it was. And then scarily, Neotame is 13,000 times sweeter than table sugar. It's made by Nutrasweet, which is a former division of Monsanto, and the original manufacturer of aspartame, 13,000 times sweeter than table sugar, and 30 times sweeter than aspartame. Uh, Neotame is actually so sweet that your brain actually rejects it if you use it, at, like they can't use it in soda because your brain would just immediately reject it as too sweet. They use it in mints though, and like little like chewing gum, they'll use like a drop of it, and you'll know, like it's extremely sweet. So. Um, it's a really interesting thing. I can't believe it really got passed. I mean, it's, I'm sure it's lobbying and that sort of thing, but I'm really shocked that it passed because it's really pretty bad. Um, okay, so does stevia work? Inevitably, I get this question. Uh, and then, <laughs> this is a study from the Yale Journal of Biology and Medicine. It's a neuroscience study. Stevia has no calories, but it's still 200 times sweeter than sugar. And then they actually looked at people consuming artificial sweeteners and the neurobiology of sugar cravings, so your brain's biology, and people actually gained weight when they were consuming the artificial sweeteners. They didn't even maintain their weight or lose weight, they gained weight. Uh, so I continue to study here, and I'll just keep this brief, uh, but you can read it, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, research studies suggest that artificial sweeteners may contribute to weight gain. What drives the desire to eat? Food reward shares the brain circuitry with other pleasurable activities such as sex and drug administration. So when you're taking in an artificial sweetener, you're getting half of the reward circuit complete, but you're not getting the other half, which drives you to eat more calories. So if you eat something that has a lot of sugar, you get the full reward, and then you kind of, and you get the calories, so you're like, okay, well that's kind of enough. But if you eat, like, uh, if you drink a Diet Coke, you're getting half the reward. It's really sweet, but you're not getting the calories. And then your body and your brain are like, hey, I need to take on some more calories to complete the reward pathway here. So that's why understanding like the biochemistry part and the brain part is really important because you'll start to see how clear this stuff is and why it's doing what it's doing. Um, and then there's a lot more detail in this study that I would definitely recommend that if you're at all interested, it's worth your 10 minutes of your time. Um, so food addiction works. Uh, we're short on time, so I'll try to speed this up a little bit. But um, this is all, well not all, but this is a brief uh, description of the pathways in the brain of how food addiction is happening. So you'll see that endorphins, beta endorphins, which you'll get from like exercise, and uh, cannabinoids, which are related to obviously marijuana and that sort of thing, and the GABA receptors aren't that far away, and they're part of the pathway of uh, food reward. And then interestingly, uh, glutamate up here, they've actually found that people with like um, ADD, autism, that sort of thing, schizophrenia, actually have a problem transporting glutamate across the brain. It's actually a biochemical thing that they didn't realize was a problem. They thought it was just something they couldn't fix, but they're coming to find that glutamate is actually really an important player in that, um, that picture. So I will skip all of the, uh, <laughs> the quotes on here, but you can look it up if you'd like to. It is very important to understand what's going on, but we've probably hammered that home by now. And then this is interesting because uh, salt, sugar, and fat, has anybody read that book? No, okay, you guys should definitely read it. It's really good. That's where this is from. But they, this guy actually studied the food industry and wanted to determine if they were making food addictive on purpose, which he kind of already knew they were, but he wanted to figure out why and how. Um, so this is pulled. They did a New York Times piece on it, and uh, it's the extraordinary science of addictive junk food. So really quickly, salt plus fat squared divided by a satisfying crunch times pleasing mouthfeel equals a food designed to addict. So mouthfeel would be like if you eat a potato chip and it's crunchy, people actually will crave foods that give a satisfying mouthfeel. Where again, not to keep using broccoli, but if you eat broccoli, yeah, it's like chewing a plant, you know, it's not that great. Uh, you don't really start craving it, and that's part of what makes these foods addictive. So the example here, food chemists use sugar, salt, and fat, right? Three things. Now they don't ever use just one because you're not gonna eventually, you're gonna get sick of it, sensory specific satiety, where if you're eating pure sugar, eventually you're gonna be like, ah, I don't want any more, that's enough. Again, you're not gonna eat pure fat like a stick of butter because eventually you'll get sick of it. However, if you add salt to the butter, 
you can eat that pretty much all day. Or, better example, you combine salt and fat at just the right ratio, and you get potato chips where you literally, their slogan was, bet you can't eat just one, which was totally correct. I mean, it's based on <laughs> science. Um, so there's actually like a U-shaped a curve to this. So if you have not enough salt and fat, people don't really like it, right? If you have too much, people don't really like it, it's too much. But if you have just the right amount, that's literally the part of the brain where you can't stop eating the thing. So you go to eat like IHOP pancakes and you're getting the salt, the sugar, and the fat, and you just can't stop eating it. Uh, it's you know very clear why that works. And then candy bars, same thing, it's sugar and fat. Donut is sugar and fat. And then food manufacturers nearly always make sure two of these three are in their foods. In fact, I've never seen an example where they didn't, except maybe Sour Patch Kids, which are just pure sugar. I don't know, maybe there's a couple that are just pure sugar. But uh, And then Matt Lalonde, he's a PhD in organic chemistry at Harvard, he has a great quote. We live in a world where food chemists make foods addictive for more consumption. That's a really important quote to take home. Uh, and he's a food chemist, or not a food chemist, he's a chemist, so he understands how this works at a molecular level. And, more than anybody would probably want to know. Um, and then the bliss point, really quickly, is just um, the entire, uh, like I said, that U-shaped curve, it's a specific point. This guy, Moskowitz, actually invented it and developed it and figured out exactly what would cause the most reward without getting too much and while keeping food cheap. So that's a recipe to make the companies profitable, but it really harms you. And we see these obese kids that are only like four or five years old, maybe six or seven, it's hard to tell. They're eating like, I mean, I would hope adults wouldn't even eat like that, but they're huge sodas, lots of fries, probably go there a lot. Um, and then you see donuts and the lady eating like a bacon cheeseburger and literally all the neurons being lit up in her brain. Um, so part of what made this happen, again, food CEOs plus greed, they want their companies to keep turning profits, specifically when they switch to like the quarter, or I'm sorry, the monthly profitable model, that's when a lot of this stuff really started happening because they were in a lot of pressure from stockholders to keep making the, uh, you know, the company money. So they were like, well, these guys are drinking a lot of soda, but they're not drinking enough soda. How can we get them to drink more? New Coke, 1985, more sugar, more caffeine. I mean, that's the smoking gun if you ever wanted to look at it because Coke wasn't doing that poorly. They just wanted to make even more money. Um, so and then, of course, market share, they want to keep people away from Pepsi. So, and then divided by food science plus plus point equals America's breaking point, and that's kind of America's breaking point right there. Um, this is from a biology course at Indiana University, so if you ever want to look it up, you can. It just explains even more in depth what I already covered. Um, and then there is one interesting thing I don't want to pass over in here. Mice, for instance, will work as hard to get a mixture of corn oil and sugar as they will to get cocaine. So that's pretty terrifying. Uh, I don't think I included it in here, but there's actually another study where they found uh, Oreo cookies were as addictive, if not more, than cocaine. And again, this was in rats, so it's not exactly the same, but you can see the translational implications there. Uh, does anybody have questions on this stuff? No? Okay. How are we doing on time, by the way? We're okay? Okay. Is anybody sick of me yet? Probably. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so again, it's not just fast food and junk food. And it, again, fast food and junk food are definitely the worst examples. Uh, if you had to cut things from your diet, that's where I would start for sure. Uh, and, but it's interesting to note other things that are going on. So 1992 study, opioid peptides derived from wheat gluten, their isolation and characterization. So let's break that down. Wheat contains gluten. Uh, gluten is actually made of glutenin and uh, I'm blank, the gliadorphin is the, the molecule, I'm sorry. But opioid peptides derived from wheat gluten, again, they're opioid peptides, they're isolation and characterization. So you can read that study and it tells you exactly what's going on, how they derive the peptides from wheat gluten. And again, these things aren't as rewarding as like eating a big, you know, Snickers <coughs> bar or drinking a soda, but it is going on, maybe to a more subtle degree, but it is there. Uh, 1979, we go all the way back to the physiology of chemistry. Novel opioid peptides derived from casein, beta casein structure of active components from bovine casein peptone. So does anybody know what casein is to start with? No, okay. So uh, milk protein is made of whey and casein. And you'll see it advertised in the bodybuilding community as like the slow digesting versus the fast digesting protein. But uh, casein has a lot of similarities to gluten and that sort of thing. It has uh, uh, beta and gamma casein have a really high proline content. So proline is one of the uh, problematic proteins that you see across the board in different foods, so like gluten. So again, you see opioid peptides derived from casein, bovine casein, which of course is cows, 
1979, they knew this. So uh, this isn't new information in a lot of ways. And then 1984, in a journal just called Peptides, demonstration of high opioid-like activity in isolated peptides from weak gluten hydrolysate. So again, confirming that uh, opioid peptides were found in gluten. So does anybody have questions on this? No? Okay. So grains, uh, people are starting to understand that they're maybe not quite as healthy as everybody was led to believe. Um, again, the, the worst thing you're eating is like some oatmeal from time to time, you're doing okay. Uh, so I don't want to demonize things too much, but you'll see like the frown face with the bread, which I really enjoy, and then uh, <laughs> the molecular structure of gliadorphin, which is the opioid peptide found in wheat, and then specifically this study from the gastroenterology in 2006, I believe. So gliadorphin, which is part of the grains we'll get to in a minute, induces an increase in intestinal permeability and zonulin release by binding to the chemokin receptor CXCR3. So that's probably a lot of science for people that aren't science majors or into science. Uh, so intestinal permeability would be stuff in your gut getting into your bloodstream that's not supposed to get into your bloodstream. So when you eat uh, wheat or gluten or something like that, you're actually opening up the barrier to get stuff into your bloodstream that's not supposed to be there. And you can specifically see the mechanism. It releases zonulin and it binds to the receptor called CXCR3. And then people have celiac disease that are totally intolerant to gluten. It actually opens it up for a really long period of time, which explains like food allergy problems, that sort of thing. People that aren't celiac disease have varying degrees of how much this becomes a problem. Um, but again, none of this is good. Like even if it's opening it up for a little bit, it's not good. If you're eating other foods, it's not going to happen. Um, so, and you can even see that in stuff like autism and that sort of thing, where it actually will get to the blood-brain barrier. And they don't think that it can cross all that efficiently. But again, some of it is getting there. And you see people on GC. Uh, GCCF-free diets, where they're gluten-free, casein-free diets, they're not actually experiencing any of the symptoms that they normally would. And it's experimental, not everybody gets the results, but some kids with really severe autism go gluten-free, casein-free, and they see remarkable improvements in some cases. So that's part of what's going on there. Um, and then while grains are universally recommended as healthy, they in fact contain a variety of problematic compounds. So refined grains, everybody in the world that's a nutrition person, if they're vegan, vegetarian, doesn't matter, agrees that refined grains are not good. Uh, they remove the fiber, vitamins, and minerals. And whole grains, where it's a little bit better, but they still pair, pale in comparison to vegetables and fruit as far as nutrient density goes. So for like 100 calories, whole grains compared to vegetables, the vegetables win out by far in nutrient density. So that's a big reason not to eat them or to make, not make them the majority of your calories. Um, and again, the problem is that they're really cheap. So governments can subsidize these things. Farmers can make these things really easily. So. That's part of why they're so widespread. Um, both refined and whole grains contain anti-nutrients called phytates, or phytic acid is what's actually going on there. They block minerals like calcium, magnesium, iron, and zinc from being absorbed. I would argue that's pretty important to be absorbing from your food. So grains then have sugar added to them to increase palatability and are made into junk food. So like those granola bars that you buy that are in a wrapper that have like 16 grams of sugar, I, I would just avoid completely. <laughs> I mean, you might as well start eating M&Ms at that point because you're getting the same amount of vitamins and minerals. And then. When you look at the package and you see like, oh, it has this much magnesium, iron, or zinc, you're actually not getting all of that, if much of it at all, because of the phytic acid problem. And vegetables contain phytic acid too. A lot of stuff contains phytic acid. So again, if you're eating kale and you see it has like 150% iron, you're not getting all the iron, uh, just to be aware of that. Um, and yes, this includes healthy foods like granola bars. We already did that one. Uh, gliadorphin is the opioid peptide found in wheat derived from gliadin. You look into this compound from its inclusion in the protein composite gluten. Uh, we already covered all that. Does anybody have questions about grains? No? Okay. There we go. Okay, so dairy, of all the things in this presentation, is by far the least problematic. And it can actually be beneficial depending on the scenario. So um, before we all freak out about dairy, it's by far the least problematic in most people. Um, so it's generally recommended as healthy, but has many downsides as well. These include the protein casein, the protein whey, lactose, IGF-1, which is insulin-like growth factor 1, and other issues. Uh, this is the part that actually you will see definitely people across the board. Uh, it has the ability to promote a histamine response. Uh, this response can cause headaches, gastrointestinal upset, exasperation of asthma, and seasonal allergies. People that are allergic to dairy are usually allergic to the lactose, which everybody knows is lactose intolerance, and usually has gastrointestinal effects, so people are very aware of it. 
but can also be a casein intolerance, which is one of the proteins, and that's more subtle. You almost get like an allergic uh, type response to that, like histamine means mucus production, that sort of thing. I've had clients that just gave up histamine releasing foods and they cured like their migraines from time to time. It doesn't happen all the time, but it, it can happen. Um, and other things, like you cut out dairy, sometimes people's bags under their eyes go away. They have less seasonal allergies. It's interesting what it does in the body. Um, but there's a lot going on in dairy, so that's why it can cause such a wide variety of responses. Um, casein and whey contain aminoglobulins, insulin, estrogens, and other growth factors that can provoke an unhealthy hormonal response. So, you know, mother's breast milk is pure dairy, obviously, and it can help babies grow, so it's necessary. But after that, we're the only mammal that consumes any kind of milk after infancy at all, let alone for the rest of our lives. So. The hormonal stuff that's going on in dairy biochemically can be a problem in a lot of people. Um, and they don't know all of the findings yet. They'll probably never know all the findings because it's such a hard thing to control for. But it's definitely something that's a big question mark and not necessarily a good question mark. Um, and as a result of these ingredients, dairy is also a hyperinsulogenic food, meaning it causes a large spike in insulin. So it's, you know, it's like getting a pretty big spike of sugar. Again, it's not sweet, so you don't really think of dairy having a lot of sugar, but go home and look at a milk carton and see how much sugar is actually in a cup. It's more than you think. Um, the opioid peptides found in dairy are called casomorphines. They've been studied for involvement in a variety of mental diseases and disorders. Uh, Robert Cade specifically identified case, casomorphine, which you see over here, as a probable cause of attention deficit disorder, which is a big, deal. Um, not, again, to say that everybody that has ADD, you know, is caused by milk or anything like that. It's just one of the things that they've found. So it's important to notice. Um, and beta casein morphine 7 was found in high concentrations in the blood and urine of patients with either schizophrenia or autism. So again, like I said, it can be, in some populations, beneficial to pull this stuff out. And the most practical way to do it is just pull it out for like 30 days, see how you do. If you look, feel, and perform better, and keep it out of your diet for the most part. And then interestingly, your body will usually react pretty poorly when you reintroduce it, and you'll be more aware of what's actually going on when you're consuming this stuff. Whereas if you're just used to eating it, you don't really know what's going on. Um, another study, if people want to read from 2000, uh, opioid peptides encrypted in intact milk protein sequences. So again, yeah, it's different researchers from the other studies. It's very well established in the scientific literature. So does anybody have questions on dairy? Okay, so added sugar by far is the biggest problem in our society as far as the diet goes. Uh, for example, who would ever guess that coleslaw has 14 grams of added sugar in one cup? That's not even total sugar, that's just added sugar. I mean, I don't even eat coleslaw, but I was shocked when I came here. I was like, I never would have thought in a million years. But that, you're not talking about homemade coleslaw, you're talking about... Coleslaw that that's buy. processed, yeah, that's like yeah. that you would buy, yeah, absolutely. And you can control the homemade stuff, which again is one reason why it's important to make a lot of your food and cook a lot of your food, because you have control over this stuff. That way if you're like, hey, I want to make some cookies, but I know what's in them, is a much better idea. It's just not as convenient. And the food industry plays on that, and they prey on it, actually. Um, so how many breads, I guess you can see the answer, but 32 out of 33 breads on the shelf contain added sugar. That didn't used to be the case even in 1970. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> Um, so you basically can't buy bread without added sugar, which is again is another sneaky way that people develop insulin problems, diabetes, all that sort of stuff. And you'll see type 2 diabetes has risen substantially as people's increase of sugar intake has gone up. So, And this is again in the scientific community, they're like, oh, well we don't have definitive causative proof that sugar causes diabetes. And I'm like, A, you're never going to get that proof because nobody's naive to sugar. And B, it's pretty darn, darn unethical to run a like 30-year study basically giving people diabetes, isn't it? I mean, you can't do that, mm -hmm. plus the economics of that are just infeasible. But the food industry will use tactics like that all the time, and it's totally BS. Uh, excuse my language, but it is. Um, so the American Heart Association, Association recommends men limit added sugar to 36 grams or 19 spoons per day, and women should limit added sugar to 24 grams or 60 spoons per day. So let's bring that down here. So coleslaw, one cup. 14 grams of added sugar, that's more than half of a woman's daily intake of added sugar. I would actually say for the most part, people do better with even a little bit less than that because they say added sugar, it probably should be total sugar. And the fact the World Health Organization, after I made this, came out and actually recommended something even lower than that. Um, but again, try to limit it to works for you. If you're more <coughs> active, you can get away with more sugar because hypothetically you're burning it off. But it's better to go for the starchier stuff that doesn't cause an immediate insulin spike. Uh, you can actually use the stuff over a long period of time, like complex carbohydrates would be better than eating fruit for the most part. Um, okay, so here's the caffeine. 
Here's the caffeine slide. I wish I could do a whole thing on just caffeine. Maybe I will someday. So this is cerebral <coughs> blood flow, right? CBF, which is brain, uh, blood flow to your brain. So we can all agree that's pretty important, right? Um, so people that are not drinking caffeine, this is what they're getting a nice lot of blood flow to their brain. <coughs> people that are drinking caffeine, you can see how much less green there is going on there. It's actually, I believe it's 40, uh, reduces cerebral blood flow by 27% on average. So people that are drinking caffeine, literally are getting a quarter less blood flow to their brain, which is pretty scary just on its own, right? Um, but that's one of the reasons it's not a great idea to be drinking a ton of it all the time. Uh, so 137 trimethylxanthine is a technical name for caffeine. It's a member of the alkaloid family. That's important because alkaloids are typically toxic to other organisms. And in fact, the way caffeine is derived, it's from a plant actually, and the reason it's in plants at all is because it's a pesticide. So this is a little bit of uh, biology and uh, I guess observational epidemiology to some degree. But so if you're an animal in the wild, right? and you don't want to get killed by another animal. You have the ability to run away, you have legs, so you don't need intrinsic defense mechanisms. Plants are just sitting there that grow above ground, so they need something in them to keep them from being eaten. So that's what caffeine is doing in these plants. So we're taking that and we're putting it in beverages and we're consuming it, and it's a pesticide. Granted, it's not a hugely toxic pesticide, except to smaller things than us, but that's the source, which is really important to note because you'll never see that in advertisements for things that contain caffeine. Um, for other reasons, but so other alkaloids, and caffeine's an alkaloid, remember that. Morphine, cocaine, nicotine, etc. So they're acting in the same way biochemically. Uh, highly addictive, it's actually a model drug of dependence in the DSM 5. So if you go look up like addictive drugs, caffeine fits all the criteria perfectly, uh, hugely addictive. 90% of humans on the, in the world consume it daily. Uh, you get tolerance withdrawal, which are again part of the uh, model drug dependence effects. So who has ever seen somebody that didn't have their caffeine in the morning and they were really grouchy? Okay, that's the onset of withdrawal. So usually they drink caffeine at like four or five the day before. So it's all been about 16 hours since they've had caffeine. That's the early stages of withdrawal. That's all that is. So, and then they have their cup of coffee and they're fine. But they don't actually realize that it's withdrawal usually, which is a little scary. Um, again, a vasoconstrictor, so that reduces blood flow. Uh, and a vasodilator would be something that increased blood flow, which would be good. Neurostimulant, it binds to adenosine receptors like we talked about earlier, uh, has a half-life of three hours, so everybody has that first cup of coffee, right? And then like three hours later, they're kind of dragging and they go for another cup of coffee or tea or something like that. That's what's going on there. It takes three hours for half of it to leave your body. Uh, and interestingly, there's more detail than I can go into on this slide, but Women metabolize caffeine differently than men. They're usually much more sensitive to it, and some of that is because of their body weight is usually lower. Um, so, again, there, there's other factors here too. Like if you eat a lower carb diet, anything you take as far as a drug is gonna be much more effective for the most part. Um, so there's actually genetic differences between individuals regardless of gender where people metabolize caffeine differently. There's a specific gene, and I don't have it in here. I wish I did, but... Um, people that have that gene metabolize it way differently than other people. So I have friends that are like super sensitive to caffeine and they got the testing done and it actually showed that they were more often than not had this gene. So it's really interesting. I do have it in one of my articles that are free that anybody could read. Um, and then there's a researcher at Stanford University, a sleep researcher, he said that if caffeine was introduced today, it would not be allowed because of not only how addictive it is, but because of how it kind of makes people go somewhat nuts, especially when they drink a lot of it, and if they don't get it, it's just very bad. And again, it's a stimulant, it's a pesticide, it has no, our body has no use for it intrinsically. We just figured out that if we took this thing from a plant and we ingested it, we'd feel kind of better. So um, there's a lot more going on there than I can cover. Uh, the metabolites of caffeine, so what your body actually breaks it down into. Parazanthine, again, it's a um, methyl trimethylxanthine is its name. Theobromine, which is interesting because it's actually in chocolate as well. So the two things that make people crave chocolate are a little bit of caffeine, obviously if there's added sugar, and then theobromine has actually been shown to be uh, psychopharmacologically addictive as well. So that's what you're craving when you eat chocolate. And again, people are definitely sensitive to chocolate too. It's another image I couldn't get in here. And then theophylline, like 4%. But uh, theophylline is interesting because it's a uh, uh, bronchodilator, so you'll see it in like, asthma medication from time to time. So. Okay, because everybody asks me, well, what the heck do I eat after all this information? So, there's not really one diet. Anybody that ever tells you there's one diet is lying to you or trying to sell you something or both. Um, 
usually both. Um, there's a variety of things that will work. And what you'll see across these diets is that there's similarities between them. It's usually unprocessed, well, it's always unprocessed food. It's usually not heavily dependent on one macronutrient, so not a huge amount of protein, not a huge amount of carbs, not a huge amount of fat, and it has a lot of vegetables. Those are the three main things. And then the fourth thing would be lots of quality protein and limiting other things that are detrimental. So like not super high alcohol consumption, not a ton of bad sugar consumption, not a lot of things that are bad for your body, like really bad fats. Um, fats, one thing I didn't even get to cover in here, but if people have questions, I'm happy to answer them. So Mediterranean diet, and sadly, it's not even the current Mediterranean diet, they've adopted our diet and they've gotten sick as a result. So the old Mediterranean diet, great example, emphasizes fruits and vegetables, olive oil, and fish. So those are like four things that are pretty much perfect as far as diet goes. And again, fruit would probably be the worst of those things, but it's not even that bad in the grand scheme. Uh, the Japanese diet, again, traditional Japanese diet, they've adopted our diet, they've gotten sick. Uh, three servings of fish a week on average, plenty of whole grains, vegetables, and soy products. Now whole grains and soy I don't love as a uh, uh, biochemistry person, but they're generally benign. Whole grains will just give you kind of empty calories. They're not actually causing any harm. But soy, the phytoestrogen content, especially for men, is a little bit iffy, and it doesn't really have a ton of great effects. But again, vegetables and fish, and the worst thing they're eating is whole grains and soy. Note that that's not processed food, that's not bad fats, really, that's not alcohol consumption, it's not a high sugar diet. You can see why that will work. And then. Pitavan diet, this is the one that people that are low carb always hate to reference because it's really high carb, uh, but it's all really good carbs. So tubers, yams, sweet potatoes, and taro root. So they're all natural, starchy sources of carbohydrates, not like a ton of uh, added sugar. Fruit, fish, and coconut. And coconut's actually a really good fat. Um, and then again, fish, so they're probably wild caught fish directly from the ocean. They don't use dairy products, alcohol, coffee, or tea. Their intake of oils, margarine, cereals, and sugar is negligible. So you can start to see by the third one all the commonalities that they all share. Vegetables, good sources of protein that are fresh caught, and limiting things that are bad. And then the Inuit diet is always interesting because people just generally aren't aware of it. And who knows what the ketogenic diet is here? Has anybody heard of it? Okay. So the ketogenic diet is typically zero carb or almost zero carb, and people think that you need carbs to survive. There's actually no such thing as a central carbohydrate. Uh, and then the Inuit diet is a good real world example of this. So they only subsisted on meat and fat, very little fruits and vegetables, and they actually had no biomarkers of bad health. Uh, these two researchers that were there in the early 1900s actually were so blown away that they did it themselves. They challenged themselves just for one year to do it, and they actually lost weight and improved their health, and they were already pretty healthy. Um, but again, meat and fats that were all from the ocean, directly caught, they were eating it. There was no bad things in their diet. They had no, avail no availability to get fruits and vegetables or anything else, because they're basically living like in the ocean and really cold climate. So that's really important, that any of these diets can work. And then if you just include all the good things and leave out the bad, you'll generally be fine. Um, but you'll notice there's nothing in here about McDonald's, Taco Bell, soda, processed foods, and that's what's more important than anything else. So, because people get all hung up on like a specific diet and all that stuff, and usually there's monetization involved in some kind of scheme. So, that's important to note. Uh, even people that have generally good intentions that write books can become really hooked on these like pet diets that everyone has to follow and everyone else is wrong, and it's just it's garbage, really. Um, I think that might be. It. Oh, okay. Well, let's just explain it even more. What can you do? Try organic food. Or as your grandparents <laughs> called it, food. And that's actually true, too. The mineral content is less in our soil now because of the way we replace the topsoil with anhydrous ammonia. Uh, it's less. There's literally a study where they looked at that. And then one simple rule, if it came from a plant, eat it. If it's made in a plant, don't. So like the Twinkie and the carrot. But so it, deep fry the Twinkie, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> there was a Twinkie diet, did you see that? This, no. Oh, this guy, this really bothered me. He was like a PhD or something. He ate just Twinkies for a month to prove that you could still lose weight eating Twinkies. And he did, but everything else went down the toilet. You know, it's like <laughs> lipids went, and I'm like, what did you do this for? <laughs> like, it's a really, it's a popular thing though. Um, so all successful diets contain real food. And then again, tenets that are really easy to follow. Avoid liquid calories. If you consume anything that's caloric, that's a liquid, just get it out of your diet. If you just change that, you will see improvements, guaranteed. Um, eat protein, eat vegetables, eat healthy fats, eat small to moderate amounts of fruit and starchy tubers for energy while limiting fructose. So again, this is where your um, 
how sedentary you are and how active you are becomes a factor. So if you're eating a ton of fruit and like the starchy sources of carbohydrates, try to be more active. If you're just sitting at a desk, you don't probably need that much. You can get away with a lot less than you think. And what you're going to replace it with is healthier fats, like avocados would be good, olive oil, that sort of thing. And it actually will be better because you'll feel more full because it has a different effect on your brain satiety-wise. And you actually get heart-healthy uh, protective benefits, especially from like olive oil. So, because uh, people will always say, well, what do I replace all these carbs with? And it's usually fats, and people vastly under-eat protein, too. Uh, that's really hard because it's hard to constantly have protein like prepared, especially if you work in like an office setting. But uh, usually like bulk food prep, like a week or two worth of food on the weekends is generally the best thing to do. You keep it in Tupperware, you put it in your freezer or your fridge, and you take it with you. Um, and then eat vegetables ad libitum. That's by far the best you should be eating the most of is vegetables. So spinach, kale, broccoli are the three best if you had to pick three. Most nutrient dense, everybody hates them, but they're like the best things you could be eating. Well, what's um, that three? Spinach, kale, and broccoli. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm, and you can email me too if you ever have a question. Please do. Um, and the reason we avoid liquid calories: low in nutrients, high in sugar, artificial sweeteners, and are easy to overconsume. And protein will keep you satiated and provide essential amino acids. I didn't even get to touch on that, but there's <coughs> nine essential amino acids. Yep. What about canned proteins, like sardines? Oh, sardines are fantastic. Yeah, uh, calcium. Like yeah, all sorts of good stuff. What other canned proteins? Tuna. Uh, if yeah. you can, if I mean, if you want to just have fish as a protein source, that's absolutely fine. But most people these days, it's a, it's a hard drive to get them to eat fish. Like <laughs> I eat them all the time, but a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to eat sardines. I don't want to eat tuna. Mackerel, I don't want to eat salmon. Mackerel. All good. Yeah. Any any fish. And again, you want to go for wild caught if you can. Farmed fish is not nearly as beneficial. Um, but the mercury thing is actually a myth. The mercury binds to selenium, specifically the selenoenzyme protein, and it actually blocks all the mercury from being toxic. There's only like three fish in the world where the mercury is a problem, and most of them are in Alaska, and you can't get them. They're, are, uh, are you serious? Yeah. Like the way they were talking about that on the oh, yeah. 20 shows and oh, stuff yeah. like that, it's like the end of the world. <laughs> yeah, I can send you the article. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for saying that, sure, because yeah, I used to have <laughs> tuna, and I gave it up because <coughs> the mercury. Oh no, totally a myth. Yeah, yeah. I can send you the article. The power of the mass meat. <laughs> well, that's the other thing I was going to say. Anytime you see something shoved down your throat from like a big media, it's usually mm -hmm. bunk. There might be like a shred of truth in there, but they need the, the news job is right. I mean, it used to be to tell the truth, but now it's to proliferate content. So you have to always have a new story, have to have a new spin, it has to be exciting, even if it's untrue. And they know it's untrue. They're not stupid people. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I think the three that had it are, jeez, uh, uh, pilot fish, which you can't even get unless you're literally in Alaska, I think, and uh, I'm blanking on the other two, but they're not ones that you would regularly consume in a diet. And even then, a little bit is not going to be a problem if you're not consuming like tons of it all the time. So, uh, but yeah, it's, I, was, I was surprised to learn that too. Um, so eggs would fall under protein. Absolutely, eggs have the, they're actually the most bioavailable so source of protein, has all the amino acids, so, yeah, and the yolks too. Even though it's dairy. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not, I mean, as far as what they're made up of, it's not really dairy. You see, like, from time to time, people have uh, sensitivity to eggs, it's usually the lysozyme protein, which again, it's molecular mimicry, it gets into your bloodstream and causes problems, but egg allergies are pretty rare compared to the other allergies, so. And eat the yolks, and if you don't want them, send them to me. I'll eat them because they have all the they have all the protein and the nutrients. Well, not all the protein, but they have all the nutrients. So. And then the other thing I read a lot about is eating the whole food, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Absolutely. Not just Absolutely. the egg, or not. I mean, not just the yolk, or not just the white, but the whole. Egg. Yeah, and the thing there, part of it is some the stomach distension. So if you eat a lot of fiber, that's why like the high fiber diet's a really good idea because. You actually will feel full and you'll under eat compared to what you used to be doing if you're eating a really bad diet. You'll actually lose weight just based on that. So any, like the thought of chewing can be good. It's weird how the brain works, but a lot of that matters. And that's part of why processed food can be so bad is that it's so quick too. And that actually plays a trick on your brain and makes you overeat calories without you even realizing it. So, um, and the egg thing, uh, it's important because people get the omega-3 enriched eggs, right? Like I personally buy them. And they, they make the egg white omelet and they throw away the yolk and I'm like, where do you think the extra omega-3 is? It's in the yolk. Like, it blows my mind what people will do. Um, but does anybody have questions? I think that's the last one. Well, I heard you can get omega-3 the, the, from the, uh, what do you call walnuts too, I think it is. It's not as bioavailable. It's yeah. alpha linolenic acid. So the best uh, omega-3 is DHA, docosahexaenic acid. So that's the one your body can actually use. So if you're buying like an omega-3 supplement, 
Just you can just buy straight DHA. DHA. About a gram a day cool. is the best for healthy adults. Eight so. gram a day. Mm -hmm. We're a thousand milligrams. Oh, yeah. Cool. And you need to literally look on the label and look at the DHA content, not the total omega three, not anything else. And the reason there's a multitude of reasons why DHA is the best, but it retro converts into EPA, which in biology things don't always go A B B A. So e EPA is the other omega three that gets touted about, but it doesn't convert into DHA. So. Uh, that's why one of the reasons why it's important. But again, I have like a whole article on that. If you ever How about read it. straight cod liver oil? Uh, usually pretty good. Uh, they enrich it with vitamin A and D, uh, synthetic forms, but that's usually beneficial too because people are sometimes deficient. In, I mean, they're always deficient in vitamin D and usually a little bit deficient in vitamin A depending on the diet. So yeah, fermented, have you tried that kind before? Yes. Really mm -hmm. good. That's the one I personally use. I think green pastures is the yeah, guy people that make it. It's, it's totally gross, but it's really good for you. So <laughs> yes. I remember choking it down the first time. I have a pretty strong stomach. So. They have one with cinnamon in it. That's yeah, it's like a gel. I didn't try that mm -hmm. one. It's, yeah. it's actually pretty good. It's better? Okay. Flaxseed, but you have to really crush the flaxseed. Yeah, you know I mean, like, flaxseed's not terrible, but it, again, the stuff that's in there that it touts as omega-3 isn't bioavailable, meaning your body can't use it. So it's I look at it as like, why oh, bother? Okay. It's a lot of work. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. The media is unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you a tip, too, on anything you're ever looking up for your diet. Uh, do you know what PubMed is? Okay, so Google PubMed, it's literally every scientific publication ever produced, at least in the US. You can get other countries too. And that's where I would go for information on nutrition. PubMed. Yeah, and even then, you can still find, I mean, nutrition is such a vast field filled with such garbage sometimes that you can find any, anything to support any point. But if you look at like a um, really good source article, and then if you have questions, you look for like a meta-analysis, which takes like 50 or more studies and then compares it, that can start to distill the best information. Um, even there, you can run a really biased meta-analysis, so it doesn't really prove anything. But I would stay away from like observational studies and go for like causative mechanism studies. Yeah, those are the ones you really want to look at. Like, we gave these people DHA, only DHA, this form. We saw these improvements as a result by this mechanism. That's what you want to look for. Everything else is like you could say anything about anything. So yeah, real quick about liquid. Mm -hmm. Um, they say you drink water, water almost helps the flow the weight off. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know what I mean? like, yeah, it sort of works like the fiber thing where you get the stomach distension, oh, okay. so you eat less as a result. But the real thing there is that they're using what's sad is the American population and the world population is a disease reference point now. Like the average person, I don't know, did you guys see the crash test dummies thing where they bumped it from 175 pounds to 275? As they said, it better averagely represented the American. Yeah, 100 pound difference all of a sudden. That was like two weeks ago. But anyway, the reference point's disease. So when they say the average person does X, Y, and Z, you have to understand the average person is now sick. So it's really kind of scary uh, when you look at current information. And I try not to read too much at one time, to be honest, because it's none of it's going in the right direction. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to be like that. It just means that the people around you might not necessarily be the healthiest examples to fall by. Um, Honestly, like look at your grandparents, or somebody my age, look at your grandparents, honestly, and what they were doing, and if they lived a long time, and follow the basic things that they were doing, because they were pretty right on the mark for a lot of things, except for the smoking. Yeah, my great aunt, <laughs> great aunt just passed away. She was 99. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, whatever she was eating, fall back. <laughs> there you go. But yeah, things haven't changed as far as the body goes. Yeah. We haven't mentioned mayonnaise. Yeah, I didn't get to that one. Uh, it's okay if you make it yourself. I would avoid the store-bought for the most part, yeah. Um, I just typically don't enjoy it that much. I don't have that many clients that are really big on mayonnaise, actually. But it's kind of like it's it's okay. What about Miracle Whip? Uh, that I wouldn't. I don't know enough about to say anything intelligent on. I wouldn't think that it would be great, but I honestly don't know. <laughs> yeah, avocados and coconut uh, oil, coconut uh, milk are really good sources of fat. Um, I would say cook with coconut oil in your pan because it won't actually like oxidize at a really low point. Mm -hmm. You can turn the heat up pretty high and won't oxidize. Whereas extra virgin olive oil will oxidize really fast in a low heat point. So like drizzle extra virgin olive oil in your salad, maybe for lunch, but don't cook with it. So if that makes sense. Yeah. Because that's where the chemistry is really important because once you understand like things oxidizing and why that could be bad, you'll start to understand really quickly like why some of these recommendations are so ridiculous. Do you know so. the product Earth Balance? I don't. What's in that? Oh, it's a soy based. Mm -hmm. Substitute for butter. Okay. Earth balance. Mm -hmm. I would say that like uh, organic butter, like Kerrygold, is actually fine for the most part. You know, if you mm -hmm. get the the processed stuff, that would be bad. But yeah, 
because they found, uh, does anybody see the cover of Time Magazine where they said butter is back? No, okay. That was like a couple months ago, and they're referring to their earlier uh, 1981, where they had the bacon and the eggs with the frown face, where mm -hmm. cholesterol and fat was like the worst thing in the world. And then, of course, all the science has totally rebuked that, so they put the cover in like May of just a big stick of butter and said butter is back. So it's like, it only took you 30 years. Thanks. And hey, what do you think about the Wendy's baconator? Uh, is that <laughs> whack? I can't believe they're even allowed to do that. You know what well, I'm saying? Eight pieces of bacon? I there's guess, a. Like, Woo. Yeah, there's a study, I didn't include it in here, but it's in one of my articles, and they looked at what actually was in fast food hamburgers. They did a sampling of like 12. Nine of them had foreign pathogens. So in the science world, what foreign pathogens means is they don't even know what they were, but they were pathogens, so they weren't good. They found, I think, brain tissue in three, like there's a whole list of what they found. And they couldn't even identify some of them, which you don't want to eat anything that a scientific lab can't identify. They can identify like pretty much anything, so. And then Taco Bell has uh, silica in their uh, their food, which is another name for uh, sand. They, they list it as silica, so nobody, yeah, it's there. It's not in huge amounts, but it's enough. So they use it to preserve things when they ship them. So they have like grade D level meat, right? Which you probably wouldn't even feed your dog, but somehow humans can eat. And then they use the silica to keep it preserved when they ship it across the place so it doesn't completely spoil, so. You'd probably be a good yeah. stand-up comedian, too, with all the information you have the way you're I was told that. that. Right? Seriously. Yeah, I've been told that before. <laughs> yeah. There's smart stand-up comedians, so I gotta give them credit for that one. Oh, that's so funny. I, sometimes I feel like a sane person living in an insane world, you know? It's like everything around you is just yeah. crazy sometimes. But, um, does anybody else have questions? I'm happy to stand up here forever if people want me to, so. No? We're good? Okay. And if anybody wants to uh, contact me, that's my website, everything that's what I write for, blah, blah, blah. So, there you go. Thanks. Well, you so you did fast. that too fast, man. Yeah, I'll, I'll, take a picture. I'll take a picture of it on my it phone. It is all online on YouTube. Uh, you can watch it for free, pause it. I mean your it. information. No, show that, oh, show uh, that last. Sure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't promote myself, so. Um, yeah. Please send me an email if you ever have questions. It might take me a little while to get back to you, but I will definitely reply. And it's usually something I've already covered, so I might just send you like an article. And the, every article has like 30 or so references that you can look up to. So, uh, and if you find something that says I'm wrong, please send that to me too, because I, I always love new information. So, yeah, that pub meds very interesting. Oh yeah, and you can get lost in there for hours. I go on like Nerd Safari on that thing where I start looking up something and you follow like references and uh, references and like yeah. three hours later I'm like, whoa, how did I get here? <laughs> so be careful on that one. It's kind of like yeah. Netflix or something where you just get lost. But Is it true, I was going to ask earlier, they say when you, when you get full, your your stomach does not get the message to your brain until 20 minutes later. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, that's about the rough time. I just that's wrote this. Unbelievable, yeah, I just man. wrote this thing yesterday actually. So um, leptin is the satiety hormone, right? So it's sent. Think of hormones as like a phone call, right? You're, it's happening in one part of your body, but it's getting sent to another. So your leptin hormone sends the signal to your brain, your hypothalamus, that tells you you're full. That does take generally roughly that time. That's unbelievable. Yeah, and there's, a, there's other things too, like if you're insulin resistant, meaning you have a lot of sugar all the time and you need more just to feel quote unquote normal, you can become leptin resistant usually as a result of that. So you don't want to be leptin resistant. And most people that are really obese are extremely leptin resistant. And there's actually people that are born without leptin and they immediately become obese because their brain never thinks they're full even though they've eaten like a ridiculous amount of calories. So. Yeah, leptin is really interesting. They only discovered it in 1996. What's it called? Leptin, L-E-P-T-I-N. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. There's, there's, there's like a whole, probably like over 20,000 articles just written on leptin. So, yeah. It's really important stuff. Is that your picture there? Are you, it is, yeah. Are yeah. you training? Yeah, uh, that is uh, at CrossFit Gym. I'm doing the ring dips. Oh, CrossFit? Business. Yeah. You yeah. do the ring dips? Yeah. yeah. Holy <laughs> smoke. What do you got? <laughs> Point zero zero one percent body fat. Uh, I'm somewhere around eight. Yeah, if you go under five, your body starts to shut down. So like, I, I got to like six one time, and I started to notice things were going awry. Like I would go outside, and uh, you just become really sensitive to cold, and like your immune system starts going. Yeah, you don't want to go too low. So, um, so things start to become awry. Yeah. Okay, so you do consulting, and you also do personal training. Consulting, personal training, and writing are my main things right now. Yeah. Yeah. So where Where yeah. do you train your clients at? Uh, usually in home or their gyms. Yeah, I used to work out of a gym. I had the 100 clients and I literally couldn't keep, I, my schedule was just insane. So mm -hmm. yeah, and it became more profitable to obviously go my own. But um, 
Yeah, I've, I've worked with everybody that had every kind of condition that you've never even heard of, probably. Like fructose malabsorption, does anybody know that I've one? I've heard of that. Yeah, you don't want that one. So fructose, we talked about it, but like if you have fructose malabsorption, you can't process it at all. So this poor girl, she literally came to me basically crying because she said, I got this list from my doctor. I went to the store to buy the stuff on the list, and I just completely couldn't figure out what to eat, and I was totally discouraged. So if she even like had an apple, she'd be in the bathroom for like two hours as a result. Oh. Yeah, your body just can't process it. So there's... There's stuff that people haven't even heard of. I had one girl that, um, she ate like a sweet potato. Her feet would just swell up completely. They couldn't fit in her shoes. She had something beyond celiac disease. So there's people that have really intense stuff out there, but um, there's always a solution, or at least a way to improve the quality of life. So uh, rheumatoid arthritis is a big one too. That's an inflammatory condition. So if you make your diet a lot better, a lot of the symptoms can go into remission, if not completely. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff out there, and I know everybody doesn't have the time to research it themselves or, you know, follow the protocol themselves, so it can help to have somebody else, so, yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.